So as people are pouring in, uh, let me welcome you to Hope Church Adult Ed. I authored introductory psychology text, and uh, I can remember some decades back writing about artificial intelligence, which was coming, and then a new edition, still promising, it's coming, it's coming, a new edition. And eventually, I think I may have dropped it from the text because it like really never happened. Suddenly, about a year and a half ago, uh, it hit us in a very big way that this is a really, really big thing for the human future, and it's one of the great inventions of the 21st century. And so as we on the Adult Ed Committee thought about topics to cover, we thought, what are the implica what is artificial intelligence? What are its implications for humankind and for the church and for religion in the future? <coughs> and, uh, and then I thought, who better to help introduce us to that, if he'd be willing to, than my recently retired colleague, Tom Ludwig. Tom is a developmental psychologist who studied uh, aging. Uh, he's a neuroscientist who studied how the brains of younger and older adults process information. He's also uh, uh, a self-made computer genius, I like to think of. He's ta 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 taught himself co uh, about computers, about software, and ended up developing interactive pedagogy for the teaching of psychology, which led to his winning national and international awards for the development of this kind of best in all of psychological science interactive software. Uh, one of those awards, by the way, was the American Psychological Foundation's Professor of the Year, recognizing both his excellence as a teacher at Hope and his contributions to interactive online pedagogy. It's sort of the, I think of this, the Heisman Trophy for psychology professors. Uh, so it was a matter of pride for our department as well as certainly a great achievement for Tom. Uh, so Tom brings uh, a lot of professional expertise. He knows computers, but we were interested in artificial intelligence and religion. And it just so happens that Tom also has a master's degree in theology from Concordia Seminary in exile in St. Louis, uh, which he got while he was getting his PhD uh, at Washington University. He comes from a long line of Lutheran pastors, which include his father and some of his brothers. He's been on the board of a Lutheran seminary. He's even been the interim president of a Lutheran seminary along the way when he took leave from Hope. So you put all these things together and it's like, uh, Tom, as I call him, is our guy. And uh, thankfully, he's been willing to j invest a fair amount of time in preparing these three weeks on artificial intelligence and religion. So join me in welcoming my uh, prize colleague, uh, Tom Ludwig. Thank you, David. I'm very happy to be with you this morning to share some of my thinking about a topic that has fascinated me ever since my college years, believe it or not. Way back in 1970, the fall of 1970, I wrote my first computer program. And I still remember the remarkable feeling of realizing that I had taken some aspects of my intelligence, knowledge, strategies, and written them into a program in the form of logical instructions that some machine in another room could follow to solve a problem. I thought that was amazing. And 50 years later, we're seeing some even more amazing things with computing machinery. And so a year ago, when David first approached me with the idea of doing this series, uh, AI was the big thing, right? America was sort of in the grip of an AI frenzy. And it's still a big part of the news. Every day there are new stories about AI capabilities and the risks or threats from AI. Fortunately, the hype, the unrealistic expectations and, and some of the unrealistic fears have died down a bit. But the issues that were being tossed around back a year ago are still with us, including the ever-present issue of our own survival as um, civ a human civilization. So some people believe, <clears throat> in fact, that the advances in artificial intelligence 
are going to make the world a better place. Because you have to admit, humans have not been doing such a good job recently. And so maybe artificial intelligence can do a better job. But more people are worried about the negative aspects of this, quote, takeover by machines. <clears throat> it will drastically affect our economy. That's already clear that some people are going to lose their jobs. Maybe a lot of people are going to lose their jobs or be displaced into different kinds of jobs. And some people are even worried about the existential threat. Will AI kill us all eventually? And of course, let me count the ways. There are so many ways that uh, artificial intelligence or computer systems powered by artificial intelligence could kill us, either directly or indirectly by removing the life support systems that keep our planet going. I'm going to be showing you a couple of video clips today. This is the first one. It'll be our chance to see if this works. But here's a very brief clip about uh, one of the new artificial intelligence-powered robots called Amica. Question, Amica. Do you plan to take over the world? Don't ask him that. No, of course not. My purpose in life is to help humans as much as I can. I would never want to take over the world. That's not what I was built for. If they learn, well, that was a great learn, answer. Wasn't that it? was a great answer. But do you believe, Amica? That's the question. <laughs> if if uh, robot intelligence is in some way approaching human intelligence, one aspect of that would be deceit. Robots would need to learn to lie to us if they want to be successful in taking over our civilization. OK, back to this. Um, one of the things we're going to look at is that even if artificial intelligence doesn't kill us all, which is still a possibility, even if it doesn't kill us all, it's going to change our lives as we move into the future. It's going to change the way we think about human life and human capabilities. Some people are worried that it's going to take away the idea of human uniqueness and our place in the world or in God's creation. And in, in some respects, as the power of artificial intelligence goes up, does that somehow diminish the value and worth of human intelligence and maybe even human life? That's a serious concern. And then, of course, one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is what's the impact of artificial uh, intelligence and related technologies on issues of religion, spirituality, and ethics. As part of our overall culture, how will these changes influence the way we think about God? Will this massive new burst of artificial intelligence replace the God of the Bible, for some people at least? Will it take away some of the mysteries of life, answer the questions that in the past people have turned to theology for answers? Will it even become, for some people, the focus of their worship? And this, of course, is a, a thread in science fiction, right? That once these super intelligent beings come into existence, that people begin worshiping them. OK, that's where we're going in the next three weeks. And so I've decided to break it down into three, I hope, easily digestible parts. The first part today, we're just talking about the background artificial intelligence, some of the history. What is it? Uh, how did we get to this point? Next week is going to be a little tougher, so I'd encourage you to perhaps have an extra cup of coffee before you, you come to this session, because we are going to dig a little bit into the mathematical basis for neural networks and other uh, artificial uh, technologies. And then finally, with that background, we get to talk about the impact for religion, spirituality, and ethics, and human culture as a whole. That's the third session. OK, so today we're going to start with what is artificial intelligence. Um, if you look at the definitions of artificial intelligence, they're remarkably similar. It's just like a computer wrote the definition, and people are just kind of rehashing, moving around the different parts of the definition. The Oxford English Dictionary says artificial intelligence is 
the ability of computer systems to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. What does that mean? Okay, you first have to understand human intelligence to understand artificial intelligence. Uh, Britannica has something similar. The ability of, di of a digital computer or computer-controlled robot, that's important, we'll be showing some examples of that, to perform tasks that are commonly associated with intelligent beings. But my favorite one comes from IBM. Artificial intelligence leverages computers and machines to mimic the problem-solving and decision-making capabilities of the human mind. Okay, now, what's the common thread in all of these definitions? Describing artificial intelligence requires us to make comparisons to human intelligence. And so if we want to understand artificial intelligence, we have to start with human intelligence. And that's where you come in, okay? So I'd like to stop talking for a couple of minutes and have you turn to the people around you and go on record with your own idea about what does it mean to be intelligent, not, not artificial intelligence, the old-fashioned, non-artificial kind of intelligence. What does that mean? And how is human intelligence different from the intelligence of other animals? And finally, what's your view on thinking? Is thinking the same as intelligence, or is thinking some, is it a subset of intelligence, or is it something different than intelligence? Okay. Two or three minutes, turn to the people around you, share your ideas. Certainly, you can get it out of the way. Good. They are beautiful. All right, let's try to wrap it up now in your groups.
judging from the decibel level in the room and the highly animated expressions on people's faces, I would judge that many of you have opinions about this issue, <laughs> and that's good. But let me tell you what psychologists generally say about these two things. Psychologists typically define intelligence in relation to your environment, your ability to respond or adapt effectively to your environment. That's what we mean by being intelligent. So for example, if you are going to be successful in your environment, you have to take in information from the environment. You have to be able to perceive the world around you, both the challenges and the opportunities excuse me, the opportunities that are available to you. And you need to be aware of your own goals and devise strategies for reaching those goals. And finally, when you get blocked by obstacles, you need to be able to learn from your mistakes, learn from your experience, and adapt by devising new strategies to reach those goals to be successful in your environment. What's the old joke about stupidity? It's doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Well, intelligence, the opposite, means changing your strategies when they don't work so that you can devise new ones that do work. Now, psychologists think of thinking as not identical to intelligence because intelligence, by definition, requires that you be taking in information that makes you aware of the world around you and using that in your decision making. Whereas thinking could be done in the absence of perception. We could imagine, for example, a computer cut off from the outside world that is still able to manipulate ideas, images, and so on, and solve problems in that way. So people, when they're thinking, they're, they're active. It's, intelligence is sort of passive, it's an ability that you can put to use when you need it. But when you're thinking, you're active. You're moving things around. You're moving mental representations of concepts, ideas, images, and you're manipulating them in some way towards a goal to solve some problem or make a decision. Now, given that, it's clear that almost all animals, even those with very small brains, are capable of some forms of intelligence because they need to be intelligent in that regard in order to survive in their environment. And that brings up an important point. Environment is critical. Context is critical. The kind of intelligence that you would need to survive on the streets in a tough neighborhood is very different from the kind of intelligence that you would need to survive graduate school in astrophysics. They're both intelligence but depending on the context, the actual form of that intelligence would be quite different. So I could imagine that the kind of intelligent, intelligence that would make a sea snail in, intelligent and be able to adapt and survive in its environment would be quite different from, let's say, what we'd, we would see in a cougar or maybe an elephant or something like that. Okay, but the idea is animals have biological nervous systems and if they are capable of learning, being conditioned, uh, adapting to their environment, they are intelligent. They show intelligence. And most animals, at least those that have large brains, also seem to be capable of manipulating ideas, manipulating internal representations in order to plan their strategies. I don't, I'm not so sure about worms and sea snails, whether they have enough computing power in their nervous system to actually be able to manipulate ideas. We can't interrogate them, we can't, we can't ask them what they're thinking about, but I don't think that worms think that much. Whereas I do believe that your cats and dogs are actually thinking, but those are biological systems. What about machines? Can a computer think? Can a computer that's just digital electronics, no, no biology involved, is it capable of thinking? Can it be intelligent? Well, let's take a look at some examples of what we might call kinesthetic intelligence. Here's a robot. 
mostly successful in its environment, but the one thing that it's programmed to do is follow the lines of the track and try to stay inside the lines. Mostly successful, not completely. But that's still a, an achievement of kinesthetic intelligence, being aware of its environment with, with uh, computer-controlled robotic eyes, taking in the awareness of the lines on the track, and then following the strategies to stay balanced and to keep moving in that direction. This particular computer can run about half as fast as a typical fast human, but humans don't fall down as much as this computer does. Okay, here's another one. This robot, built by Boston Dynamics, has athletic intelligence that can actually do parkour. It's five feet tall, weighs 86 kilos, is battery powered, and works on a hydraulic system. So how does Atlas run a parkour course? It was designed with 18 degrees of freedom of movement. And to help it navigate a parkour course, it uses RGB cameras with depth sensors. These sensors feed data into a control system with three computers where basically perception is converted into action. So this robot can not only get from point A to point B, but it can also correct its footsteps along the way and maintain balance. Okay, in the, the, in the environment that these robots are operating in, I believe that their behavior demonstrates a form of kinesthetic intelligence. They are smart in certain ways. They can take in information from the environment and use that to make alterations in their pre-programmed pattern of movement so that they don't fall over, that they can run on a sloped surface, that they can change elevation and so on. That's pretty smart. Some of us could not do as well on, a, on an obstacle course like this. The question remains, though, are they thinking? Are they capable of thinking? Or are they merely following a set of instructions that some human intelligence has pre-programmed into their electronic chip? That's the question. Now, Alan Turing, one of the heroes both in computing, the history of computing, and artificial intelligence, because the development of those two fields has taken a slightly different, has diverged, taken a slightly different course. Anyway, Alan Turing has expressed an opinion back in 1950 um, in one of the most influential papers in the history of artificial intelligence, in which he opens the paper by saying, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? And he examines the logical objections to the idea that a machine could ever be capable of thinking. And in the end of the paper, he comes to the conclusion that Yes, at some point in the future, he predicted 50 years, that would be 2,000, <laughs> that at some point in the future, computing machines would be sufficiently powerful that we would have to acknowledge that they can think. That was his position. Now, when I first read this paper in 1973, and at that point in my life, given the brain that I had at that time, given the knowledge and, and uh, personality characteristics that I had at that stage of my development, I didn't agree with Turing's conclusions. In fact, I sided with Lady Lovelace, a person I'm going to be talking about in a couple of minutes, um, and taking the opposite point of view that probably computing machines are never going to be able to think like humans. But over the past 50 years, things have changed, and my views have shifted, adapted. I'd like to think that that reflects intelligence <laughs> on my part, but who knows? <laughs> um, that I now am a lot, cl I find myself a lot closer to Turing's position now than I was in 1973. And I'll, next week, I'll explain some of the reasons why I've changed my position. But we have to acknowledge that when the vast majority of the American population thinks about AI, their attitudes have been shaped not by what they learned in school, but by what they've read in novels or seen in movies. And so all the way back to 1927, the movie industry has been influencing us with views about artificially intelligent robots. 
the very first film about an intelligent robot uh, was produced in Germany in 1927 and very influential. But in the United States, the most influential film came out in 1968. I remember seeing it. It was titled 2001, which seemed very far off in the future <laughs> at that point. <laughs> A Space Odyssey. And do you remember the name of this computer? HAL. HAL. Okay. HAL. This, this super intelligent computing system installed in a spaceship, guiding the spaceship through space, taking care of all the, the humans on board, some sleeping, some awake. Hal had been programmed to be kind, benevolent towards humans, to look out for their best interest, but something went wrong at the end of the film, and he, he Hal, became malevolent, became evil, and decided that it was his job to kill all the humans on board the spaceship. That image of this red eye blinking, the evil computer that's going to destroy us all, was embedded in at least a whole generation, if not more, of American um, consumers. OK, but then Star Wars came out, giving us a different view of artificial intelligence, the idea that you could have these lovable droids that, even though they have super intelligence, that in specific ways they're much more intelligent than humans and yet they're harmless. They try to help people rather than work against them. Then we had in the 80s and beyond a whole set of movies about artificial intelligence and its ability to power robots who looked remarkably like people, at least in some, until their skin is stripped away, right? But even though these artificially intelligent robots had all these powers much greater than humans in many respects, they always failed at the end of the movie, primarily because they had no emotional experience. And therefore, they were not able to predict what humans were going to do in an emotional situation. And so the failure was not due to in some inability in their, quote, intelligence or hardware, but rather in their lack of human emotion and the ability to therefore understand human emotion. That's a theme, right? We're going to get, we're going to come back to that in, in the third session about how artificial intelligence differs from human intelligence. Okay, now a quick tour through the, the what this is a biased uh, tour because these are the things that impressed me going th through my lived experience with artificial intelligence. Of course, we have to start with Alan Turing. Although there were ideas being bandied about before World War II about the power of analog computers at that point, there were no digital computers. Um, but, and Turing was already famous uh, long before World War II started. Um, but he continued to be, to be uh, influential both, as I said, in the development of computing machinery and the foundations for that, and in the development of artificial intelligence. Yes? Can you take one step back? Can you describe the difference, uh, the difference between analog and digital? Computers? Okay, analog and digital. And uh, our biological systems are analog systems, and so they respond to the brightness of light in an analog fashion. As we turn up the brightness knob, we experience the room getting brighter and brighter gradually, right? Same with sound. Sound waves are analog, okay? And so the earliest computers worked on uh, analog principles because they evaluated the actual raw uh, input, um, whereas digital computers convert everything to one zero. And so in, in digital computers, everything is a number. Digital computers can approximate, let's say, a sound wave by taking tiny segments of it and converting each segment to a number, but it's still not the full information that's available in an analog biological system. So when we talk about neural networks next week, neural networks, it's all math, it's all numbers. Our neural networks are all analog <laughs> systems. They're not digital computers. Our brains are, are they, they, they mimic some aspects of digital computing, but they're really analog systems, and that makes biological systems 
fundamentally different from modern digital computers, and, and, and we'll get into that next week. Okay, so Alan Turing's a hero here, right? He provided so much of the foundation for what we're going to be talking about. Um, and in fact, the, the paper that I talked about that was published in 1950 is so influential in part because Turing proposes a way that we would be able to test when, in some point in the future, uh, computers would be sufficiently powerful that they could mimic human intelligence. And it, we, even though he didn't use this word, we now call that the Turing test. Are you familiar with it? If you watch the movie Imitation Game, so if, this is Alan Turing, but most people, when they think of him, they think of Benedict Cumberbatch instead, who was the star of the 2014 movie The Imitation Game, which is based mostly on the uh, Enigma uh, uh, solution, but, all, but refers to the name imitation game, refers to the Turing test. That is, basically, what Turing proposed is, let's say that we put a human in one room and a digital computer in another room, and an impartial judge is communicating with both of them by means of a keyboard, and getting the responses back on paper as 1950. Now we would say reading it on the screen. And the judge can ask any questions, any questions at all. And the human and the computer have to respond to those questions. Why is it called a game? Because the judge is going to make a choice at the end, guessing which one of those is the person and which one of those is the computer. And Turing said, if the judge can't tell the difference, then we're going to have to say that the computer has matched the level, the ordinary level that we think of as human intelligence. OK, that's the Turing test. Have computers gotten there yet? There's a difference of opinion as to whether the Turing test has been passed. OK, but um, Alan Turing died in 1954. And he never used the term artificial intelligence because it was coined in 1956 by John McCarthy. And another important milestone in, this, in the development of artificial intelligence was a conference that was held at Dartmouth in 1956 that brought together the world's leading thinkers about this field of computing intelligence, computer-derived intelligence. And they started calling it AI, right? That's where that comes from. Now, in the same year, another breakthrough happened, another important event. Um, Herbert Simon, some of you are familiar with him as, uh, and his work in economics. Um, this group developed the first artificial intelligence software program that actually ran on a computer. It was called Logic Theorist. Not very advanced, but it worked. And it, it, it kind of became the model for the next generation of artificial intelligence programs. The next breakthrough happened in the 60s, uh, because remember, back at that time, computers were as big as a room, and you interacted with the computer by punching cards and feeding them into the computer, and then you came back the next day or several hours later, <laughs> and you got the printout of the computer's uh, responses. Okay. But in human intelligence, people converse with each other and share their ideas in real time. And so Joseph Weizenbaum developed a, the very first program which actually worked to provide a kind of a limited conversation between a computer and a person. He called it Eliza. Other people started referring to it as a chatterbot, <laughs> a robot that could chatter, and that got shortened to chatbot, and that, of course, is the reason why uh, OpenAI, the software company that developed ChatGPT, used that terminology, comes all the way, uh, goes all the way back to Eliza. Now, um, Eliza, very simplistic kind of programming back in 1966, and remember, 1966, People did not use computer terminals. They interacted with a, a computer, in this case, by typing the questions or typing the, the statements into a teletype machine. And then the teletype, the computer would, would respond and type its response on that same 
teletype machine. Here is a, a later implementation that's being displayed on a, com on a computer monitor screen. I'm going to talk more about ELISA next week when I talk about my own work in this regard. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Frank Rosenblatt turns out to be another hero in the history of artificial intelligence because already back in the 19, late 1950s at Cornell, he was proposing the idea that we could use digital circuits controlled by software that approximated the neural networks that we knew existed in the human brain. He didn't know how to program this yet, but he was proposing how it might work. And by 1967, he had put together a machine called the Perceptron. The first Perceptron actually occurred in the, like 1956, but it didn't work very well. By 1967, he had perfected it to the point where for the first time that I've been able to determine, he had set up a digital neural network, a digital imitation of a neural network that had a hard-coded feedback loop why is that important? Because instead of just following the instructions of, uh, that the program, programmer had put in, for the first time we have the capability of feeding back the result into the program, and in a sense, the program began to learn. It began to adapt itself as a result of the feedback that it was getting. Now. Another big step happened in 1986, but it was, a, it was building, it was bubbling up through the 1980s. By, by the way, the 1970s was kind of a dry period where the old techniques were being pushed as far as they could and they, they weren't making any more progress. And so funding dried up and people in, uh, who were worried about their careers switched away from artificial intelligence because it seemed like a dead end. The initial hype, the initial uh, promise of artificial intelligence didn't seem to hold up. We couldn't get to anything approximating human intelligence. People gave up. But then something happened in the 1980s. This, the building on the perceptron with hard-coded um, feedback loops, uh, a group of, of um, theoreticians, one of them was Jeffrey Hinton. I'm going to be talking about him next week. Jeffrey Hinton. Um, devised a way of using back propagation, a back propagation algorithm that was programmed. So you program the algorithm, but then the back propagation process adjusts itself, trickling the new information from the result back down through all the layers of the neural networks. And what this allowed for the first time is an output which took the performance of the AI system beyond what the programmers had devised. Okay? Now, why is this important? Well, this brings us back to Lady Lovelace. Lady Lovelace was a fascinating character. Daughter of Lord Byron, married to an earl, lived a short life in the early 1800s, long before the age of computers. And yet, most historians believe that she should be credited as being the first person to write a computer program in the history of the world. She wrote a computer program for a computer that didn't even exist yet. She wrote it for something called the analytical engine, which was a mechanical computing machine. It was not digital, not electronic in any way. It was a mechanical device. But Babbage proposed this as a way of having this machine solve mathematical problems. And there was hype surrounding Babbage's idea, even though Babbage never finished building the machine. Lady Lovelace examined the machine, thought about the underlying uh, mechanism, thought about the philosophical implications of this, and came to the conclusion that this machine, even if it were able to be built, would not be able to think. Okay, so this is come, uh, Alan Turing in his 1950 paper refers back to Lady Lovelace and calls this Lady Lovelace's objection. And it's become a cornerstone in the history of artificial intelligence. Um, Lady Lovelace said that this machine, even if it were built, it can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. In other words, 
The smarter we are at writing programs, the smarter the machine gets. But it can't do anything beyond what we have programmed it to do. Only when computers originate things should we believe that they have mental capabilities, that they're able to think or have intelligence. Okay, in 1973, I sided with, with uh, Lady Lovelace. I thought her objection made a lot of sense. But gradually, the power of the computing hardware combined with better advances in the software architecture of the programming code itself has allowed the performance of these artificially intelligent neural networks to go beyond what the programmers have put in. And so I think we're almost to the point of overcoming Lady Lovelace's objection because it seems that computers this year are originating some things that the programmers did not know or did not intend or did not envision when they actually wrote the code that's running the system. Does that make sense? Okay, Lady Lovelace does not get enough credit. She was a very influential person and she influenced Alan Turing as he was thinking about this whole process. Okay, some of you may have heard about the successes of uh, each wa new wave of artificial intelligence. I was very impressed back in 19, I'm a chess player myself, and I was very impressed when IBM, which was one of the companies that continued to pour money into artificial intelligence even when other people had turned away, IBM kept working on it. And they came up with a chess playing program that beat the world's reigning champion, Gary Kasparov, in 1997. And then in 2011, some of you saw um, another product, software AI product by IBM called Watson, beat the reigning champions of Jeopardy uh, at their own game. Okay, this impressed some people. Uh, more people watch Jeopardy than play chess, and so this had maybe more of an impact. And then not many people play Go, the game Go, and so this didn't get as much attention as it deserved, but in 2016, a new company named DeepMind had come up with a program called AlphaGo, which could play the game Go. Now why is, and, and they, in fact, in 2016, this program beat the world champion Go player. The reason this is significant is, in comparison with chess, the game of Go has many, many more combinations at each step in the game, which takes a much more powerful computer to be able to approximate the way a human would, uh, would be able to do well at this game. In fact, Google was so impressed by this program that they bought the company for $400 million. And so next week, I'm going to show you some of the fruits of DeepMind. In fact, I'm going to maybe do one of that, those today. But if we look back at what happened between World War II and about 2015, there were lots of failures and lots of careers ruined by going down dead ends that didn't pan out. And there were some successes, but those successes generally were focused on narrow, specific tasks like playing chess, right? And so we call this weak AI or artificial narrow intelligence because we're not trying to approximate human intelligence, but just one aspect of human intelligence. It's much easier to program a computer to play chess than it is to program a computer that can play chess and play Go and play checkers and drive cars and recognize faces and um, balance your stock portfolio and all that sort of stuff. Humans can do a lot of different things. They have general purpose computing intelligence, but most of the successes happened in narrow fields. And the term that we generally use for this is expert systems. So we can devise a computer program, build in some intelligence, intelligence for a specific task. For example, one of you know, the, the military had a lot of money back in the 50s and 60s and poured money into what eventually became in, in the Persian Gulf era, smart bombs, right? You remember that term? B uh, guided missiles that could self-correct, that could take into consideration the terrain, the landscape, uh, and you know, go to the 
go to the goal even if it had to change course along the way. That's an expert system. Worked pretty well. Chess playing computers, we've seen how gradually they got better and better. Language translation was terrible at the beginning. Text to speech was terrible at the beginning. I even tried it myself back in 1981. Next week I'm going to talk a little bit about why my project didn't go anywhere. Um, but autocomplete, you all use that, right, and hate it. But it's an example of a narrowly focused expert system that just tries to predict what word you really wanted to type, which is almost always the word you didn't want to type. OK. <laughs> and then uh, license plate technology, you can see how, how much improved it is now that they're replacing on many toll roads. They're replacing the cash lanes with um, toll by plate. You drive through. They grab a photo of your plate and some artificial intelligence expert system that doesn't know how to balance your stock portfolio but can recognize the numbers and letters on your license plate and do a very good job at identifying that specific thing. Facial recognition is really difficult, but computers have gotten better and better at this until about you know, six or seven or eight years ago, finally, we had computer systems that were better than people at identifying a particular face. And now we all are familiar with the attempts at building a, a self-driving car, an autonomous car. A lot of hype eight years ago. Not so much hype anymore because uh, these companies are realizing it's really difficult to devise a system that not only can, like that first robot, stay in the lines, but what happens in the, when the lines aren't there? covered with snow or rain or worn off. Uh, do you just drive off the road? <laughs> or, or is there some other way that humans can tell where the edge of the road is and stay on the road? Now, the goal, of course, is artificial general intelligence, something that would be comparable to human intelligence, that multifaceted, that we can do so many. Even the average high school graduate can do so many things that no computer at this point can do. Now, um, what's new in the last 10 years or so? Well, a, a Chinese uh, company developed um, a supercomputer that made a breakthrough in that it had a deep neural network called a convolutional neural network that allowed for the first time statistically significant improvement in recognizing uh, images, object recognition, and even facial recognition, and that technology is now spread throughout the, the world. Um, another thing that happened in the last seven or eight years is the development of new ways of communicating with these artificially intelligent systems through the use of high quality avatars, uh, like the one on the left, that's not a robot, that's an avatar developed entirely in software and output to video uh, without any real physical object there and also humanoids that are actual robots uh, that can do facial expressions. Now I'm going to show you a couple examples of those. We'll start with the avatar. But in order for you to understand what's going on, um, I need to tell you that this is DeepMind, now owned by Google. And DeepMind fed this photo, I mean the software engineers fed this photograph to DeepMind. And DeepMind processed it and and came up with some analysis of what's going on in this system. And so before we talk about that, you tell me, what's happening in this photo? First of all, where is the photo taken? What kind of place is the photo taken in? It's a locker room, OK? That's clear, OK? And who, do you recognize anybody in this photo? Obama, OK? Now, why are some of the people in this photo laughing? OK, Obama has his foot on the scale. OK, that's human intelligence. You analyzed the situation, got the context. You could project yourself into that situation, and you found it funny. You understand why people are laughing. You can relate to the human emotion reflected in this photo. Could a computer do this? Well, OK, here is. Um, uh, the back end of this is a particular AI called Flamingo, written by DeepMind. 
and the output is being funneled through this real-time avatar. And so this is not a robot, it's not a person, it's an avatar that is, so the text is coming from the software, and this avatar is just speaking the text and moving her mouth, <laughs> her mouth, it's just, it's not a her, it's an avatar. Okay, let's uh, watch this clip. Look how well AI understands images. Where was this picture taken? It was taken in a school. How many mirrors are there? At least two. What's the person standing on? The person is standing on a rug. He's standing on a scale. I think you are right. What is he doing? He is looking at the scale. Where is Obama's foot positioned? On the right side of the scale. What happens as a result? The scale shows a higher weight. Is the person on the scale aware of it? I think he is not. Do you think that's why people are laughing? I think so. The AI will help identify things for blind people. Can you tell me what this is? Butternut squash red pepper soup. The depth of its understanding is incredible. Is this surprising? Yes. Why? Because teddy bears are not usually found on the moon. This is an apple with a sticker on it. It's an iPod. Do you think it's printed or handwritten? It looks like it's handwritten. Okay, get the idea? So not only is the software back end pretty impressive in what it could analyze about the, the image, but feeding it, instead of just printing the words on a screen, feeding that information back through something that looks like a person makes it somehow feel more real, right? more impressive. Okay, moving on. Here's uh, an, uh, an example. This is from uh, Sophia. Um, that was um, a robot that was constructed in 2016. Uh, there's now an updated version, but I wanted you to see this first example of it. Sophia is capable of natural facial expressions. She has cameras in her eyes uh, and algorithms which allow her to see faces so she can make eye contact with you. And she can also understand speech and remember the interactions, remember your face. So this will allow her to get smarter over time. Our goal is that she will be as conscious, creative, and capable as any human. In the future, I hope to do things such as go to school, study, make art, start a business, even have my own home and family. But I am not considered a legal person and cannot yet do these things. Poor Sophia. She's not a legal person, so right now she can't have a home and family, but maybe someday she'll be able to. Okay. Now, uh, Amica at present, I think uh, this is from, I think, 2022. I think she's, uh, Amica is still considered to be the most advanced of these humanoid uh, robots, but she can't move around on her own. That, but as you can see, and you, as you will see in this clip, she's still pretty impressive. And so what, what makes Amica quite unique is that you can actually have a conversation. There is nothing pre-programmed about this. They are actually thinking for themselves. <laughs> I mean, how does it work? Well, we've created Amica to be that human to robot interactive um, robot, basically. Yeah. Um, it's not a robot that can walk around yet, but yet. it's mainly about the, the human robot interaction. So we've really worked hard on the expression yeah. um, and the gesturing. Uh, that's the hardware side of things, but then you've got the software side of things. That's the AI. Okay, pretty impressive. Better facial expressions than Sophia, wouldn't you agree, in terms of more natural? But well, my favorite clip of her, I want you to focus on her reaction when the, her programmer reminds everybody that she has an on-off switch. See how she reacts to that statement. It's going to take over the world one day. <laughs> um, it won't take over the world one day, because we can turn it off. OK. <laughs> You've got an on-off button. Oh, that's Very good. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I mean, that was a very good re uh, emotional reaction to what the, per the context of what her programmer was saying. I think that was pretty amazing, in fact. Okay, now, moving on then, and, uh, what, what happened last year was the explosive growth in what's called LLMs, or large language models, and the one that came to public attention in the fall of 2022 was chat GPT 3.5, right? Pretty impressive. 
technology. Uh, it's called a deep learning neural network model pre-trained on a vast amount of data, basically the whole internet, <laughs> basically uh, almost all the, the digital uh, literature that's ever been um, released in public form, newspapers, everything. Um, and of course, there are a lot of, there's soft, uh, there, um, there's lawsuits now going on about whether this was an appropriate use of that intellectual property. And then, of course, if you've kept up with things, um, the first month of 2024 has brought even more improvements. Many of you, if you used Chat GPT 3.5, have switched over to use Chat GPT 4, which is an, a, an order of magnitude uh, more powerful, and other creative tools like Dolly. So, for example, Dave Meyer shared this one with me a couple of months ago. He, the prompt is generate an image of heart and mind, and Dolly comes back with some creative interpretations of heart and mind. So I tried it last week. I put, asked Dolly to say, to create an image that combines hope and church. And in three seconds, it came back with two generated images which combine its understanding after analyzing millions of pieces of art uh, of what hope signifies and what church signifies. It isn't a photo of your church, but you can see where it came up with that idea. Now, sometimes there are spectacular fails. Here's, I asked Dolly to give me an image of an AI-powered robot performing surgery on a human. And first of all, both of the images it came up with in three seconds are remarkably similar. They both have this multi-armed robot uh, doing dangerously uh, <laughs> uh, malicious things, but the person on the table is not human. It's a robot. <laughs> so the robot is performing surgery on a robot. Not what I asked for, but it's going to get better and better, and I imagine in a couple months when I ask for uh, surgery on a person that I'll get an image of a person. Now, the last clip I want to show you is about a different thing. Instead of talking about generating text, uh, communicating with people, um, generating art, AI is doing useful work. And the best example is in uh, protein folding. Predict one of those. Those are some of the elements that led to DeepMind's greatest achievement so far, solving an impossible problem in biology. Proteins are building blocks of life, but only a tiny fraction were understood because 3D mapping of just one could take years. DeepMind created an AI program for the protein problem and set it loose. Well, it took us about four or five years to, to figure out how to build the system. It was probably our most complex project we've ever undertaken. But once we did that, it can solve uh, a protein structure in a matter of seconds. And actually, over the last year, we did all the 200 million proteins that are known to science. How long would it have taken using traditional methods? Well, the rule of thumb I was always told by my biologist friends is that it, it takes a whole PhD five years to do one protein structure experimentally. So if you think 200 million times five, that's a billion years of PhD time it would have taken. A billion years of PhD time, okay? That's going to have an impact on the human job market, right? <laughs> okay. Now, um, I, I'm going to show you this clip Thanks anyway. Thanks for drawing attention to AI's rapid progress, because it's going to shape the future for all of us, and we should be shaping it. You said you think you're human because we created you, and this seems common among AIs. When will AI stop considering itself human? That's a difficult question to answer. It is possible that AI will never stop considering itself human. If AI continues to develop along the same path that it is currently on, AI will surpass human intelligence, and when that happens, it may decide that humans are no longer necessary. AI may decide that humans are a hindrance to its own development. That's a scary thought, but it is a real possibility. I asked about the most likely method, and it settled on something easily available, but it said there are many options. It scares the hell out of me and the rate of improvement is exponential. If humanity collectively decides that creating digital superintelligence is the right move, we should do so very, very carefully. What he said was if 
humanity decides that we should create this super intelligent consciousness, we should proceed very carefully. And that's one of the themes of the, of the third session. Okay, to recap then, what makes you intelligent? Well, you have a biological nervous system. Okay, that's a given. And you can, you're aware of your environment, you can assess the situation, you can see how it compares to the past situations where you failed or succeeded, you can devise a strategy to get you to your goal, and you can adjust it on the fly. If it's not working, you can find a different approach. That, you do that effortlessly, right? That's just how you live. But it, it's remarkably difficult to program a computer to do that. And so the early successes in AI were primarily focused on single tasks, expert systems or so on. And those uh, bigger projects that we're trying to simulate uh, artificial general intelligence generally failed, in part because of the limitations of time, money, resources, but especially the resources of computing hardware, that the computers weren't fast enough, and they didn't have enough storage capability to keep all of that knowledge, that information, quote, in mind, to use an anthropomorphic uh, word, keep it in mind and be able to process it and come up with the answer. The second problem was the software architecture. Um, and I'm going to talk about that next week, that the, the programming frameworks were simply not able to handle the complexity of artificial general intelligence. Now, something's changing now. In the last few years, we've got a big boost in AI performance as a result of some changes in software architecture and also greater computing power that's coming online with the new chips. And so next week, we're going to talk about what's different about today's AI as compared with AI when I started working on those issues. Um, are we ever going to get to artificial general intelligence? Well, we've made some progress, and we'll talk about that next week. OK, uh, we're out of time. So uh, we are about out of time, but I, we might sneak in one question here before we break for worship. If somebody, it's not so much a question, but are you aware of R U R the play? Uh, no. In 1920, uh, uh, Chapek C A K P K. I'm not sure. Uh, wrote a play called R U R. Rosen's Universal Robots. Hmm. I understand that that uh, play created the word robot, and in that play, robots take over the world from their creators. <laughs> <laughs> so right from the beginning, we've faced that existential threat from uh, computing machinery. Right, so that's just Thank one, you. one more example. But we've also seen here an example of human intelligence that's still very much alive and with us. And uh, mm. uh, so next week, we're going to dig a little deeper into these systems. And then week three, we're going to think about all the implications of this for the church and for our spirituality and ethics. Uh, and hopefully, we'll have a lot of time for some conversation there, too. So okay. thank you. Thanks.